Hi, I'm Dr. Robert Dean. I'm part of Advanced Regenerative Orthopedics. I'm here to tell you a little bit about what we do here and our program called Aeromotion. Aeromotion is a revolutionary microprocedure that will allow you to get more function out of your knees, hips, and shoulders, and hopefully not have to have a replacement surgery. We're a team of physicians and surgeons, interventional pain, physical medicine rehab, internal medicine, sports medicine. We even have Dr. Nick Willett, who's a PhD professor at Emory University. His specialization is regenerative medicine, and he's in the Department of Orthopedics doing this research. So he's our reference point. So we're trying to triangulate different technologies to help preserve your natural joint. So how many people have been told they're bone on bone? Right? And you have to have your joint replaced. That's, that's, the, that's the tagline right there. You're bone on bone, you have to have your knee replaced, and we'll do it Tuesday. Well, what does that actually mean? And why does that sound like, boom, there's nothing else going on in the universe? Well, as you can see here in the slide, you've got an image of an x-ray, and you see the left and the right. There's an R and an L on the top of the slide there. This lady came in. This is a real patient, very nice woman. And she came in because her left knee hurt. Her right knee was fine. And you can see that there's certainly no space on the right knee. Her issue was that the surgeons, all of the surgeons she had gone to see, they wanted to replace the right knee and then the left knee. And her answer is, my but my right knee doesn't hurt. Why, why do you want to do that? And well, it just looks awful on x-ray. Now, I'm a physician, and we use x-rays as a tool. If your knee hurts, your left knee hurts, and we do x-rays of your left and your right knee, and your right knee is fine, there is no reason to have surgery on your right knee. It's not bothering you. It's not, nothing urgent about it. Okay? An x-ray shows us pictures, and we have to interpret those pictures and apply them to the treatment of medicine. But if you look at this person, again, she has narrowed space. You see less space on the inside of the knee, and it looks like the bones are touching. Why is that? Well, first of all, between those two bones is a cartilage called... Uh, the meniscus. The meniscus is a leathery pad that's there. It's a cushion, a buffer between those two bones. And that's important because when we're running around 15 years old, climbing trees, doing sports, all that fun stuff, that meniscus is there creating extra cushion. What we don't realize is that on the tip of the bone, and you see this in the x-ray as the shape of the bone, but coating that tip of the bone is another cartilage called hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage is a hard Teflon-like material that's protecting your bone in addition to the meniscus. That hyaline cartilage is protecting the bone because bone's alive. It has nerve endings, it has blood vessels. And throughout life, as you run and play and do sports or even maybe have an injury doing something, you actually start to wear and thin out that hyaline cartilage. And when that happens, the nerves are not as protected as they should be. And when you put pressure on those nerve endings, because they're not as protected with that hyaline cartilage coating, you get pain. And pain is the impetus. Pain causes inflammation. And that inflammation is itis inside of your joint. That's arthritis. So that arthritis in your joint starts off with nerve pain. And that arthritis perpetuates the nerve pain as you basically wear and disintegrate that hyaline cartilage that's protecting your joint. So when a surgeon says you're bone on bone and you have to have a replacement, what they're really saying is, okay, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, I'm really good at what I do, but I have two tools. One is arthroscopy. I go in with a scope and we shave and we cut and we grind. And for example, if you have a meniscus that's torn, flip-flopping, getting stuck and you're falling, well, you take an arthroscope, you go in there and you cut out the piece that's getting stuck, that's flip-flopping. And voila, you're better. When you repair a meniscus, you don't glue it or sew it or stitch it back together because the meniscus doesn't have any, it has very poor blood circulation, so it's not gonna heal. So what we do is we remove the piece that's getting stuck, and guess what? Yeah, when you do that, you got less meniscus to help you cushion. And those people that have had meniscus surgery, say 15, 20 years earlier, they tend to develop this arthritic degenerative joint disease faster than most people would because their anatomy's been changed. So remember, an arthroscope is a cutting, grinding, stitching instrument. Now, if you have that hyaline cartilage coating the edge of the bone, and that hyaline cartilage worn little potholes, you're not going to be able to cut or shave that, right? Because it's a pothole. So there's no role for arthroscopy. So the only treatment or the only other surgery that is available to a surgeon is to remove the whole end of the bone where those nerve endings are living, create a cap, uh, sorry, create a, a post, and then apply a cap or a crown, which is the joint implant. The idea is if you have a 
cavity. You go to the dentist and the dentist says, yeah, you have a little cavity. We're gonna go ahead and put a crown on your tooth. Whoa, that sounds very dramatic. But that in fact is what's happening. If you just have knee pain or hip pain or shoulder pain, but if you just have knee pain, for example, and you're walking without a cane, without a walker, it just hurts. You essentially have thinning of that cartilage, which is equivalent to a dental cavity. Taking that joint, removing it, and then creating a cap and then putting in an implant is essentially like having a crown put on a tooth. It's actually almost exactly the same thing. So the point is, orthopedic surgeons have arthroscopy, which is cutting, grinding, sewing, stitching, and replacement where you remove the whole joint, therefore you're removing those nerve endings, so then the pain goes away. When you have no space because you're bone on bone, what that's telling the surgeon very simply in x-ray is that if you're walking in and you have pain and stiffness, but you're not falling because something's getting stuck, there's no space because there's no meniscus left. When there's no meniscus left, there's nothing to remove or shave or cut with an arthroscope. Therefore, the only other thing I can do for you as an orthopedic surgeon is replace your joint. So if you're bone on bone, you have to have a knee replacement because there's nothing else surgically that can be done for you. Therefore, go home and deal with it, take your Advil, or we can replace your joint. So bone on bone isn't some death uh, you know, diagnosis. It's just a matter of fact that the surgeon is saying, I've got two tools to treat you. And if you have no space and you have no mechanical issue getting stuck there, the only tool I have as a surgeon is to replace your joint. What we've done is we figured out something to bridge in between medication and total joint replacement. Here's a drawing of exactly the same thing. So if you look at the, the image on the right, you see the top bone, the bottom bone, and you see the white, hard, glistening hyaline cartilage, and then you'll see some thinning, which is represented with a reddish color, and then there's a pothole. Remember, your knee's a hinge, goes back and forth, so you're gonna wear in a linear way, whereas your hip's a ball joint, so it's gonna wear a little differently. Again, as you wear, you have less protected nerve endings, and as those nerve endings are less protected and you put pressure on them, it hurts. It might throb, it might ache, it may not be a sharp acute pain, but every time you irritate and you have pain, pain stimulates inflammation. It does that by secreting certain neuroproteins. Those neuroproteins affect different cytokines, which are inflammatory proteins. When this happens, you get inflammation or itis in your joint, arthritis, and the joint gets tighter, stiff, right? and that stiffness and tightness puts pressure on those same nerve endings and then the cycle perpetuates itself. If you look on the right, you see an arthroscopic image of the same thing. You can see the nice pale yellow hyaline cartilage in that drawing, actually that photograph, and then you see that pothole. That's real, and when you hit that spot, it hurts, and when it hurts, your joint swells up. On the top of the screen, you'll see it says chondromalacia. Chondromalacia is the medical term for basically potholes in this cartilage. And just think for a second, what is this hard hyaline cartilage? If you've ever eaten a piece of chicken, right? On the tip of the chicken bone is that hard white cartilage, that's hyaline cartilage, okay? And as you're wearing out that hard chicken bone hyaline cartilage, that's when you start having nerve endings exposed in the bone, and that's where this pain arthritic cycle originates. So I live down here in Florida, we're in Tampa, and I like to reference hurricanes because we just have to deal with hurricanes all the time. So what is a hurricane, right? A hurricane is hot air and hot water spinning and spinning and spinning. But remember, typically something happens, like off the coast of Africa, something happens and the whole thing starts spinning. When that starts, it gets bigger and bigger, works its way into the Gulf, <clears throat> because as it gets into the Gulf, the water's hot. So heat is the most important element in a hurricane. There are no hurricanes right now, it's March. Why? Because the water's cold, it's 64 degrees. You're not gonna get a hurricane, no matter how windy it is. Arthritis is the same way. You have pain perpetuating inflammation. The inflammation stimulates the pain and then the pain perpetuates more inflammation. That's the cycle. So if we can remove the pain, not only will you feel better, which is nice because you can start doing things and stretching and exercising and working the joint, but when we remove that pain, we've turned off the storm. We've turned off the itis. So when we have patients that come in with grapefruit-sized knees and we turn off the pain, when they come in for their follow-up visits, usually around three or four weeks, the joint has shrunk down to normal, they have much better range of motion, they're, they're shocked. And that's just because we've turned off the pain. So pain is the heat, just like hot air in a hurricane, the pain is what's perpetuating the arthritis. So here's a more complicated slide. 
but if you look at this, arthritis is like a hurricane. This is the inflammation pain cycle, okay? And on the bottom, exposed sensory nerve endings, that's really what's starting this whole process or perpetuating this whole process. There's an X there called RFA, radio frequency ablation. This is a procedure that's been around since the 70s. It's not new. It's FDA approved on Medicare, so on and so forth. We can use this technology to basically block the cycle of pain inflammation by turning off the pain. And I'll show you how we do that. So if you go to the left, you have pain from hypersensitized nerve endings. These nerve endings, again, we think of nerves as fibers that have electricity and they talk to each other. Well, they also talk to each other via different neurochemicals, neuroproteins. Substance P, which is here, substance P is the protein that is increasing the heat. It's stimulating cytokines. If you look to the right side where it says feeding the storm, these cytokines are inflammatory proteins that are causing the itis in your arthra, aka arthritis. Okay, and these cytokines increase inflammation and perpetuate cartilage destruction. And as you destroy more and more of that hard hyaline cartilage that's supposed to be protecting the bone, you get more nerve endings that are less protected. You get more pain. More pain secretes more of this substance P product and so on and so forth. This is the cycle. If we can break the cycle by stopping the pain, we've taken that angry inflamed arthritic joint and normalized it. So the idea with our emotion is first to normalize the joint and then B, put an orthobiologic, something in there to also perpetuate or well not perpetuate, but promote healing beyond your own healing process. Because again, most people that come to us have had this problem for decades. You need more than just your own body's healing method. We need to help you with some medicine. So that's the idea of pain and inflammation. So your knee hurts, your hip hurts, your shoulder hurts. When I mention knee, hip, shoulder, and even the facets, the little knuckles of your back, your spine there, these are true joints, right? So there's two bones, there's hyaline cartilage coating the bones, there's a capsule. This is called a synovial capsule. And in the capsule is this viscous lubricating fluid called synovial fluid, okay? So these are all true joints, and that's why we treat them, because again, we're identifying a specific joint. But you go to your doctor and your knee hurts, and they say, yes, you have chondromalacia, you have arthritis, you have this wear and tear of the cartilage. Lose some weight, exercise, let's see how you do. Doc, I can't exercise, my knee hurts, it's a problem, right? This is what we hear all the time. Yeah, but still, okay, fine. Take some Advil, Motrin, Aleve, here's a script for Celebrex. These are anti-inflammatory medicines that reduce some of the inflammation because of those cytokines. So it takes some of the pressure off of that joint. However, it's not fixing anything, right? We're just kind of band-aiding everything and getting you through the day, the week, the year. Has anyone ever had a shot of cortisone? I'm sure some of you have. What is cortisone? Cortisone is the best invention of the 1950s. <laughs> it's been around that long. It's super duper Advil. You inject the joint with cortisone, and I've heard people say, oh, I got a cortisone shot that lasted two years. So the cortisone is only there for about two, three days, two to three days. But it's such a potent, potent steroid what it does is it turns off all those cytokines, those inflammatory proteins, so dramatically that they're just off. And guess what? If you've got decent hyaline cartilage and you just hit a spot that kind of triggered this one episode of swollen knee, you're going to do pretty well for a couple of years. But as you wear and wear and wear, eventually that cartilage gets thinner and you're going to hit that nerve ending again and boom, it swells. People will say it worked two years. The first time, the second year, it lasted about a week or two. Why? Because again, the potholes and that chicken mucage, that they got deeper. So you're, you're hitting the nerve pain, causing the inflammation. So since the steroid is only there for a couple of days, it's doing what it's supposed to do. It's working the way it's supposed to. You just have gotten worse, deeper potholes or chondromalacia, and you keep hitting those nerve endings. Think about it like this. If you're, if you're 20 years old and you've got perfect joints and you whack your knee on something, what's going to happen? It's going to hurt. If you hit it really hard, it's going to hurt like the Dickens. And then a few minutes later, the joint's going to swell up. And you might be limping around for a week, but after a week or so, the joint heals. So pain stimulates inflammation, these cytokines, and those cytokines actually promote healing. That's the normal cycle. However, what arthritis is, is an abnormal feedback loop. You're whacking that knee every day for 20 years. Guess what? That's not normal. That's where you start destroying the hyaline cartilage and other tissue structures, and that's where you get these potholes because that's an abnormal cycle. So again, 
the pain stimulates the inflammation in a one-time situation, that's great, you heal. But if it's over and over again because it becomes this arthritic injury type scenario, it's going to wear out the cartilage. If any of you ever had hyaluronic acid or Simbisc or Orthovisc, any of these lubricants in your joints, these are meant to increase the viscosity of that synovial fluid. Now, synovial fluid helps lubricate inside of the joint. What's interesting about this, people call it the gel shot, is that the gel shot's only in the joint active for about two or three days. There is one company that makes something called Duralane, which lasts about 50 to 60 days. But the point is all the other ones are there for a couple of days. So when I inject you with this gel, the gel isn't actually lubricating and coating your potholes for six months, if, because people typically like to see six months of, of relief from this. What it's doing is it's binding to a receptor. It's an immunologic uh, action again. It binds to this receptor called CD44, CD44. And CD44 stimulates your synovium, the capsule, because it's alive, to make more hyaluronic acid. So you're actually being triggered to make more of your own lubricating substances to help with the flow and the, the movement of that joint. So these medicines, these Simvisc, Orthovisc, these hyaluronic acid products, they're actually called orthobiologics, orthopedic biologics, okay? And orthobiologic is a good thing because it'll stimulate your system to actually heal. We use these with our patients, but we use this in conjunction with the radiofrequency ablation because if the arthritis, if the hurricane is still running at full force, I can put anything in that hurricane, it's not going to have a chance. It's kind of like taking a beautiful planted flower or planted potted flower and trying to plant it on the surface of Mars. It's not going to grow, right? Unless you're Elon Musk and then he's got a dome and then we'll plant the flower in the dome. But the point is the flower is not going to grow in a hostile environment. If you take that same pot of flower and plant it somewhere in the middle of a valley in Colorado in the spring, it's going to do very well. So the idea of arrow motion is first normalize the environment, which is what the RFA, RFA does because we're turning off the pain cytokine inflammation cycle. And now that joint environment is normalized, like the valley in Colorado versus Mars. And then the orthobiologic can work exponentially better because almost anyone who's ever had the gel shot hasn't had the best thing to say about it. Well, that's because it's not really being used in the most optimal way. We're using it in, an, in a corrected environment. And when that happens, there are healing and regenerative properties because that's what this does. It's very interesting. If you read the, read, read the literature from the manufacturers, there are a lot of amazing uh, claims and studies that are associated with hyaluronic acid. We just don't see it on a daily basis because we're using it as a last ditch effort. Oh, here, we'll do this before we just replace your knee. So again, you have all these medications and then in the end, surgeon sitting there with his catcher's mitt waiting for you to come have your joint replaced. Well, we'll just cut out the joint, put in this implant and you'll be perfect. We'll talk about that as well. What does that mean? So that means that you've got pills, cortisone, hyaluronic acid, you have medications, you know, live with the pain, do your best, and then joint replacement. So joint replacement is a great surgery. We are not anti-joint replacement. Listen, 25% of people we see in consults, one in every four people that come to us, we look at their images, we evaluate them, we say, no, <laughs> you should be really happy you can have a joint replacement. You know, if your ball joint which is a nice round ball and socket. If that ball isn't round, if it's flattened, if it's collapsed, if it looks like a head of cauliflower, that's not getting better with anything. You should be happy that you have this option of joint replacement. But if you have a nice round ball and socket and you just have a little narrowing in the x-ray because there's less space because your hyaline cartilage is thinning, having a knee replacement, sorry, having your hip replaced, because we're talking about the hip here, is like literally having a crown placed for a cavity. So what can we do to preserve your natural joint and to buy time so that you can extend the life of that joint. Because remember, a replacement, a knee replacement, hip replacement, shoulder replacement, these replacements are, are not forever. You're not getting a bionic knee or bionic shoulder. There are a lot of restrictions. And if you look at our website, we have all kinds of articles from the manufacturers and so on and so forth, showing us that, I mean, you get from a knee or a hip 10 to 15 years is what you're expected as far as activities. There are many, many suggested restrictions, like no twisting, torquing, running, all these things. And I've had patients say, well, I went to five different orthopedic surgeons. They said I couldn't play pickleball. This last guy says he can do the surgery and I'll be able to play pickleball. I'm going to go with him. Uh, 
that's probably the guy you don't want to go with, right? But again, people will listen or hear or say anything they want to get the result they want. The fact of the matter is that over 20% of people that have perfect surgeries, perfect replacement surgeries, no complications, the implant's right, surgeon did a superb job, 20% of the time people have as much pain or more pain than they did before the surgery. Yeah, so you're bone on bone, you have to have a knee replacement, we'll do it Tuesday. Let me get the doctor because I'm the nurse practitioner, right? That's, the, that's what medicine is today. But the point is that we'll do a Tuesday. Oh, by the way, you have an 80% chance of having less pain than you do today. You need to understand that because these are very important facts that are typically left out. And I don't know why. The only mentality I can think is that a surgeon is looking at you saying, listen, you have no other option. You have chondromalacia, your knee hurts. If you can't live with the pain, I can do the surgery on you. And if it works, which it should work because I'm a surgeon and everything works, right? But if it works, you know, you'll be happy. If it doesn't work, well, you're unhappy now. You don't really have any other options. So let's give it a try. You can't go back once you have a replacement, right? We're grinding down the joint to two, cat, to two, craw, to two posts and putting in this implant. So it is a big deal. And we listen to our physicians Actually, we don't really listen to our physicians, right? Do we take our blood pressure and cholesterol medicines? No, we really don't because we don't feel it. But if our knees hurt, we want relief. And again, we will do what we have to do to get out of pain. So let's figure out if there is an option, which is what our emotion is, to reduce or minimize or eliminate the pain, help promote healing. And again, we need to rehab. We need to strengthen the muscles and ligaments around your joint because if your knee's been hurting you for five or ten or twenty years whatever it might be your quads your hamstrings they've changed because they've been adapting to your altered gait because again when people have pain when you hit this spot they're going to land on this spot instead of this spot so you start to walk a little differently because we don't want to take drugs we don't want to take medicine we just want to live a comfortable life so reconditioning the muscles and ligaments once that pain has been mitigated with the procedure. That's a very important part of what we do. And that's what this is all about. So our motion is a micro procedure with an injection and rehabilitation, strengthening, reconditioning. The RFA, which we're going to talk about first, which is radio frequency ablation. Again, it's been around since the seventies. I did not invent it. It's a needle with a microprocessor that generates heat. And when we find a nerve, that's the culprit nerve telling you that there's a pain syndrome somewhere, we can disrupt that wire so that you don't feel the pain. So in your knee, for example, and I'll show you an image of that, you've got the genicular nerves. These are sensory nerves. Now remember, every joint in your body has nerves that tell you it hurt. If your knuckles are swelled up and you have knuckle pain, arthritic knuckle pain, guess what? There's a little nerve in that joint underneath of that hyaline cartilage where the potholes are telling you, ouch, this hurts. And that perpetuates the pain inflammation cycle. Same thing with your knee, your shoulder, every true joint in your body. So if we can find that nerve and turn it off, well, that would be a pretty cool thing, right? However, we don't want to turn off the nerve and then have you start running marathons and doing crazy things to destroy your joint, right? The pain is there to tell you that there's a problem. But on the other hand, the pain is also stimulating the destruction of your joint because of the arthritic hurricane feedback loop. So again, back to our academic slide. So the drawing on the right is a knee. You can see the, the white shiny hyaline cartilage on the top. The meniscus is down underneath and that's the ACL, your ligament in the middle holding them together. As that hyaline cartilage, that hard Teflon chicken bone cartilage thins, the nerve endings underneath are now less protected. You put pressure on those nerve endings, you get pain. And then the pain stimulates the cytokines and the inflammation. And here's the cycle and the feedback loop of arthritis in your joint and the destruction of that hyaline cartilage. Again, the drawing, I'm sorry, the, the photograph is an arthroscopic picture of normal hyaline cartilage and literally a pothole. So this is why you have pain. Arthritic knee pain is because you've actually worn out the hyaline cartilage coating the tip of the bones. Most people don't understand that there is actually cartilage coating the tip of the bone. Your ball joint and your shoulder, there's the same hyaline cartilage your hip, the same hyaline cartilage. The problem with hyaline cartilage is that it's not something you can stitch up or, or fix like that, right? It's alive, it's a coating. So there's no role surgically for anything other than cutting out the whole joint and putting in a 
titanium and Teflon ball and socket. If we can turn off the pain, turn off the inflammation, and promote healing so you can fill in those potholes with your own cartilage cells using whatever we can to promote that healing, well, that would be a much better plan. And again, you have to qualify. If your joint is mechanically still in really decent shape and you just have these small cavities, people do extremely well. And we promote rehab afterwards as well. So here's a sciency slide. And again, if you look at this on one side, when I'm looking at the screen, it's the left side. I apologize, I'm not sure what you're seeing. You see the normal joint. The blue represents the hyaline cartilage. That's coating the bone there. So the blue that's coating there, that's the happy, healthy Teflon protecting the bone. And then you see here genicular nerve, for example, and there are blood vessels. That's inside of the bone, okay? Well, when you have years of inflammation and cytokines and inflammation and cytokines, what do you do? you basically have destruction or thinning of that hyaline cartilage. Those nerve endings become hypersensitized, and boom, you start making more cytokines and interleukins. Substance P, which is highlighted here, is the actual neuroprotein that these nerves are secreting that is perpetuating this whole cycle. So if we can block the nerve pain and turn off the secretion of substance P, the whole cycle just fizzles out. Just like if there were a hurricane and you could just turn off the heat, the hurricane would fizzle out. This is a fun picture. Uh, it's hard to see because of the quality of the, the print, but you've got a couple of guys here. We'll call them doctors. They're mopping the floor. The floor is wet and the sink is overflowing and you can see that it's ridiculously messy. But listen, this is what you do in medicine with Advil, Motrin, Aleve, cortisone shots. You're trying to solve a problem, but you're not going to the root of the problem. With the ablation, by turning off the nerve pain, we're shutting off the valve. We're turning off the spigot. When we turn off the spigot, oh, now we can mop up the floor and actually have an end product, actually solve the problem. So that's what we're looking at. We're looking at solving your problem. And the first thing we want to do is turn off the spigot, which is turn off the pain. So if we block the pain, we can break the cycle. And again, this is normal FDA approved stuff that's been out there. It's just not being applied to large joints, mainly being used in spine. So if you look at this drawing here, you see the yellow. These are the genicular nerves. The genicular nerves are specific sensory nerves to the knee. The motor nerves, the ones that move your legs around, they go through the back of your knee. So they're not even in the same neighborhood. It's impossible to hit a motor nerve when you're treating this. And this is all done with local anesthetic. You're awake. If you don't like needles, we can give you some Valium. We're doctors, right? But what we do is we find these nerves. We do everything under fluoroscopy in this room, for example, and in, under sterile conditions. And then when we find the nerve, we basically let the computer, which has a whole software system, heat up the nerve for about 90 seconds to disrupt it. And when you disrupt it, the nerve endings no longer are going to tell you, ouch, you're pushing on that nerve in my pothole. Now, if we do that and tell you to run off and have a nice life, that's not the idea. Because again, if you don't have these feedback of pain, you're going to beat up your joint. And then you'll end up having your joint replaced very quickly. The idea is to turn off these nerve endings so you can start reconditioning your joint properly with, with proper supervision. That's why we have board certified physical medicine rehabilitation doctors as part of our team. The other is once that microenvironment is not hostile, healthy leukotriene, uh, sorry, healthy interleukins and other things, other chemicals, proteins will come and actually promote healing of that worn out, destructed part of the cartilage. And we'll also supplement it with other things like hyaluronic acid and other orthobiologics we're going to talk about. So radiofrequency ablation, again, is a FDA-approved procedure that's been around since the 70s. It's something that is used primarily in spine when people have arthritic pain in their facets, the knuckles of their spine. You can actually turn off the little branch called the median branch to those nerve endings, and then the back pain goes away. Not the radiating pain down your leg, because that's usually something pushing on one of the big nerves, but the actual arthritic pain in your back. Well, again, it's the same process in those facets as it is in your knee, hip, or shoulder, where you've worn out that hard Teflon coating, that chicken bone cartilage, and have little teeny tiny nerve endings that get irritated, causing inflammation. So as you can see here in this slide, it is a needle-based procedure. When we're done, you have a couple of band-aids, you get up, you walk out, and life is good. So you don't have that big surgical recovery time you would have from a big surgical replacement surgery. So let's talk a little bit about orthobiologics, right? What is an orthobiologic? Well, 
you have hyaluronic acid, you have PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma, you have amnion, you have stem cells from fat, bone marrow cord. These are all classified as orthobiologics because they're used in orthopedics and they're biologics. And when you use them in that manner, they're supposed to do good things. Whether it's healing, regeneration, whatever the claims are, the idea is that this, this biologic is stimulating something positive in a joint specifically. Dr. Willett, I mentioned earlier, Dr. Nick Willett is a PhD scientist up at Emory University in the medical school and in the Department of Orthopedics, and his research is specific into uh, regenerative medicine. So that's what he does all day. And we've had regenerative medicine research, stem cell research in this country for decades. It's been in academics, it's been in laboratories, hasn't been out in the public, and sadly in the last couple of years there have been a lot of uh, shenanigans, a lot of different people making claims that they can cure all kinds of diseases with what they're calling stem cells or regenerative products or IV this or IV that. So today we're just going to talk about what the different products are and I want you to understand that everything I discuss, everything I reference, you know, I have Dr. Willett to help me with resources. So we either have textbooks of medicine from graduate schools or articles that are put out by very reputable uh, sources like the New England Journal of Medicine, so on and so forth, to back up everything we're saying. We're not here to make a claim that is not realistic. But the point is that these products do stuff, we just have to understand how they work. And I have to start off with this slide because it kind of makes everybody go, wow. Scientists grow a full-size beating human heart. Yeah, right? So if you look at this picture, this is actually from my cell phone. So I googled Harvard iLab, like iPhone, Harvard iLab. I googled Harvard iLab heart, and this image pops up on my phone. Okay, That's where this is from. Well, what happened? Well, they took a human heart from a cadaver. They removed about 85% of the myocardium, the muscle of the heart. Then they put it in this chamber and put all the nutrients and electrolytes necessary. And then again, for months and months, they infused billions with a B of lab grade because you can grow cells and expand cells like that in a lab if you're using it in a lab circumstance, lab setting. They infused these stem cells to see what, the, what happened to this heart. And what happened over this time is that the myocardial tissue regenerated and eventually the heart grew back to its normal state. If you go to a YouTube site and type in Harvard iLab heart, you'll get the same thing, but they actually zapped the heart and evidently it started beating. I haven't seen that, but this is what they say. <laughs> well, how did this work? How do these lab-based stem cells work? Well, first of all, stem cells aren't actually stem cells. They're stromal cells. They're, they're influencer cells. They're pereocytes. What they do is they are placed or they get into an environment where there's injury, and then they start secreting these different factors. Factors to increase microcirculation, factors to attract the right building blocks, the chemicals, proteins, the nutrients you need to to actually build cells, they secrete factors that are responsible for what's called proliferation. Proliferation is doubling, 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 right? So if you want something to grow, you want there to be positive factors for proliferation. They even secrete factors that are anti-cell death or anti-apoptosis. So the word apoptosis is a lab term for when a cell dies. So here you have this, this cell, this stromal cell, this pericyte, that is now in the neighborhood of, say, in this case, these myocardial cells, they're making all of these factors to stimulate that myocardial cell that's left to double, 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 double. And this is what happened over time in this particular model with billions of cells secreting even more, billions and billions of factors to nurture these cells to regenerate. So these stromal cells these pericytes, they are basically secreting factors that are essentially fertilizer, a very, very basic way of putting it, to allow and stimulate the cells you're trying to heal to grow and regenerate. So that's the story of this. And what's interesting about this whole scenario is that it was done at the Regenerative Medicine Center at Mass General Hospital. This is done in Boston at Mass General Hospital. So stem cells, stromal cells, pericytes, they grow stuff. You're not going to cure an autoimmune disease. You're not going to cure autism. In the right scenario, they nurture the growth and the healing of tissue in that area. An example, if I cut myself, I'm going to bleed. And after I stop bleeding, I block the bleeding. That injury is going to send factors to my bone marrow. 
And my bone marrow is going to send a couple hundred stem cells. They're going to engraft or bind to where that injury is. And they're going to start making those same factors, increasing circulation, attracting the right building blocks, promoting proliferation, inhibiting the uh, apoptosis or cell death. And guess what? My skin cells are going to start proliferating, growing, 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 until they fill that injury with a little bit of scar tissue, and then the whole process is over. So the point is, stem cells stimulate the tissue to grow, grow, grow. They don't actually become the tissue. So the scar tissue is actually skin cells that have grown to fill in where you've injured your skin. The stem cells, the stromal cells, the pericytes, whatever you want to call them, they stimulated your, your cells, your skin cells, to actually grow and heal. That's what proliferation means. That's how these things work. Okay. So let's talk about the different kinds of orthobiologics. Okay. We've got ortho, joints, orthopedics, biologics, biologics. Okay. We have hyaluronic acid, PRP, and amnion. So hyaluronic acid is what we actually talked about earlier. Hyaluronic acid is the gel shot. Okay, it's not just a gel shot. There's actually an immunologic component to that that stimulates uh, healing, viscosity, decreases pain. It's actually amazing. It just isn't being used properly because the joint is angry and inflamed, like I had said, like the surface of Mars. We need to convert it or basically turn off the hurricane so we have more of the surface of a nice valley in Colorado so we can grow things, okay? PRP, people have heard of PRP, it's platelet-rich plasma. A lot of you have had PRP and have been given the guise that this is stem cells. There are no stem cells in PRP. Sorry, they're factors, right? Those little factors are the, hearing, the healing proteins, molecules that help promote healing, but factors are proteins, they're not alive. So they're there for one, two, three days, doing their thing like fertilizer, but then they're gone. There are no stem cells in PRP. Amnion or amniotic tissue, amniotic fluid, this is from the amniotic membrane of a baby, right, during pregnancy. There are a bunch of labs that are FDA registered that actually take this and, and purify it and isolate it, and you can purchase it. It's very expensive, but it's the richest source of those same factors that help promote healing. So if you're applying it to a wound every other day, you get really, really nice healing of, of these wounds and these ulcers, say a burn victim. The problem is, again, you have to put these products in the environment at a much higher frequency, you know, every other day, every third day, whatever, to promote healing, because they're protein factors that are stimulating a cascade, but again, you're not stimulating or bombarding that tissue for weeks and weeks that you would when you have cells that are actually making the factors. So hyaluronic acid, PRP, and amnion are all products that are there for a limited period of time, but they stimulate the right products, the right factors, the right products to promote healing, and it's a cascade effect. Adipose, fat, bone marrow, and then cord cells, these are sources of cells that also have, you know, hyaluronic acid and the different components of PRP in it as well, but there are living cells in all of these things if they're extracted or isolated properly. At least that's the idea behind this. But again, these are these stromal cells, these periocytes, these influencer cells that secrete factors and proteins to promote healing. They don't turn into tissue. That's not what they do. So adipose, typically you get some fat, draw it out, spin it down a centrifuge, wherever the cells are supposed to be at, you put that wherever you're going to use it. In the uh, November 2017 statement from the FDA, they said you should not use fat-derived stem cells in joints. Okay, why? It's the FDA's point of view. We can talk about that, but the point is the FDA said adipose-derived stem cells shouldn't be used in joints. So if anyone's using fat-derived stem cells in your joint, they're not compliant with the FDA, you should question why these people are actually doing that. As a back note, amniotic fluid also is something that's not supposed to be used in joints per the FDA letter. Bone marrow, on the other hand, again, you make a small incision, aspirate about 60 cc's of bone marrow, spin it down in a fancy centrifuge, wherever the cells and other products are, that's what you pull out and you inject into, say, a joint. This actually is a great source of the right kind of cells, the stromal cells, the, the stem cells, as well as PRP and other nutrient factors, and this will create the right environment for hyaline cartilage to grow. So this is a very good product. It's a slightly invasive because you have to obviously take it from the person. And being old or young doesn't make a huge difference in the quality of the cells, but it will make a difference in the number of cells. 
and there's a very nice Mayo Clinic study where they've aspirated bone marrow, spun it down, and did what they do best in the Mayo Clinic. They ran up to the lab, and they counted the cells, and they were between 30 and maybe 40, 45 million, sorry, thousand, 30 to 45,000 cells that they called, based on the labeling, MSCs uh, per aspirate. And those patients were all under the age of 60, but I think they were all over 50, if I'm not mistaken. So again, good source of cells and other factors. The point is those cells will make these factors for up to about two to three weeks per studies that have been done uh, where they've, isol they've radio-labeled cells to see how long they're around. Cord cell is something that's new, um, about three and a half years in this country. Again, this has been in Japan, South Korea, and Europe for decades. What is this? So basically when a woman has a baby, a lot of times she'll want to pay to freeze the afterbirth. So that's the placenta, the umbilical cord tissue, the, the blood, part of this, all of this, none of this, you know, that's, that's the idea behind that. So they're paying to actually cryopreserve this in an FDA registered cryobank. Why do they do this? They're freezing this product because they want it for the child. So when the child is born, you have the afterbirth, God forbid that child is 35 years old and ends up having leukemia, right? Well, now you have a source of their, their cord blood, their cord tissue, so that they can use that if they need a bone marrow transplant. So that's the idea as to why most people will cryopreserve afterbirth for their child. So it's there for the child. The child is growing up and living a happy life. So there are labs now, about a dozen FDA registered labs, that will take this sort of tissue and using technology isolate the cells as well as the PRP and the hyaluronic acid and all this other good stuff from that tissue, the cord or the wall of the uh, uh, umbilical cord is called Wharton's jelly. Wharton's jelly is the name of the pipe and then there's blood and stuff inside the pipe. But primarily the Wharton's jelly is where they try to chop up and extract as much of this product and cells as they can. Um, and again, it comes in a, an FDA registered uh, uh, lab that is screening for diseases. Remember the first lab will screen for diseases as well. And then what's interesting about core blood and core tissue that we don't think about is it's actually immunonaive. So again, back in the 70s, 80s, you'd hear about Johnny has leukemia and he has type A, B, O negative blood. He needs a bone marrow transplant, you know, typically on the five o'clock news. Well, that stopped in the 90s or so because they figured out that if we use cord blood versus adult bone marrow to do bone marrow transplants, there's very little, if any, rejection. So almost really all bone marrow transplants that are occurring today are using cord cells from cord banks throughout the country. So the point of this is why? Well, think about it. The cord blood and tissue is going between the mother and the child. They're genetically different people, right? If the mother is an adult and the child grows up to be an adult, it's unlikely they can actually transfuse each other's blood because they may be different blood types. Yet while in utero, they don't reject each other. And the reason for this is that the cord blood and cord tissue is immunonaive. Essentially, they have minimal, if any, markers on them, and that's why they don't get rejected. So again, there are registrations with the FDA. If you go to FDA.gov, you can actually look up any of these labs and see if there are any adverse effects or problems or complications they've had with anything from infection to rejection. But the point is that it's screened, and it is very, very safe, I believe. And... Um, it's something that is a technology we should be aware of. But these are the different sorts of orthobiologics, whether it's hyaluronic acid, which is a prescription that you can get off over the, with a prescription at the pharmacy, to PRP, which is from your blood, to amnion, which is again from a lab, to the different sources of, of cells, whether it's fat, bone marrow, or core derived, and they all do their thing. I like to talk about hyaluronic acid because I think it's really underrated. I mean, combined with the RFA, which is the nerve disruption, you can really maximize the effect of this product. It improves synovial fluid viscoelasticity, makes it more slippery, which is good for your joint. Again, there are many, many, many studies showing how it actually helps regenerate cartilage or prevent the destruction of cartilage. Even some of the package inserts show that, you know, if they use the hyaluronic acid, the chondromalacia is extremely diminished compared to non uh, hyaluronic acid supplementation, but it works by diminishing those negative anti, uh, those negative uh, angry uh, pain modulators or cytokines, as well as uh, desensitizing the nerve endings, so you indirectly um, uh, stunt the pain inflammation cycle. 
But again, we always call this the gel shot, the lubricant shot. People don't understand it, but it's actually a fascinating orthobiologic. This is the big fun slide. So if you look at this slide, you have this cool looking cell thing here in the middle. On the top, it says healing factors, which are proteins. On the bottom, it says mesenchymal stromal cells. Those are the cells. So the cells, again, this guy in the middle can theoretically represent that. The cells make the factors, okay? The cell is alive. If it engrafts, it engrafts. It's there for a couple hours, a couple days, maybe up to about two weeks or so. But the point is that these cells make these factors. What are these healing factors? They're proteins, right? So you're pumping out these proteins. And if you look on the right side here, angiogenesis, for example, you have all these funny letters, F, E, G, F, A, blah, blah, blah. These are each representing a different type of factor. But this group of factors stimulate angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is forming little capillaries. So you can bring food and you can bring electrolytes and proteins and chemicals to the injury so it can heal. If you go down under that, there's chemoattractive factors. These are the factors attracting those right chemicals and proteins. So that, that microenvironment where you're trying to heal either the cut skin or anything else has the basic building blocks to grow. On the other side, on the bottom, you see proliferation. These are factors that are actively stimulating those cells that you're trying to heal to actually double, 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 double. And on the very top, again, is anti-apoptosis. You're actually inhibiting cell death so that cells will live longer. But the combination of all these factors, and again, there are other ones here, but the combination of these factors creates a, a whole system of promoting healing, proliferation, regeneration of tissue that's around or in the area or the neighborhood proximity-wise to these healing factors and or to the cells that make these healing factors. And when you have that in an intense way, you go from destructive cartilage, right, those bad immunomodulators, the chemo, uh, the cytokines, to good, healthy, cyto, anti-inflammatory healing products. And that's the idea is to tilt things from destruction to healing and proliferation. And this is the slide that kind of summarizes it. And what I like to tell people is that it's kind of like if we all go to Maui and there's an earthquake under the island of Maui in the middle of the ocean, that earthquake's going to last a minute, maybe two minutes. It doesn't last a very long time. But what happens after the earthquake is that you get a tsunami wave that goes all the way to Alaska, right? The same thing. You want to create a big enough event, whether it's with factors or the cells and factors or stimulating the CD44 or whatever else, so that that microenvironment is now stimulated to proliferate for a number of days, months, or even years sometimes, so that those cells will grow. So again, there's an action that happens, and then there's the after effect of the action. And the goal here is to create the best microenvironment so that you get optimize that action and reaction, and then put the best product in that's appropriate for you, because everybody's a little different, right? Everyone's... Uh, Chondromalacia, everybody's situation, everyone's health, so on and so forth is different. That's why we look at all the orthobiologics and then in a visit, in a consult with one of our board certified physicians, MDs or DOs, we are all board certified physicians that are going to see you, we'll review your images. If you need more images, we will go ahead and order them. But then we'll tell you exactly what we think would help you and how we go about doing it. It's very, very straightforward. There are no surprises. So again, after this, and when you have the procedure, we have our board-certified rehab doctors, physical medicine rehab docs, that are going to prescribe your rehabilitation process. Remember, when we do a procedure, we don't just treat you and send you on your way. We follow you for months and years after that because we want to see how you do. And remember, your joint is more than just the hinge. You've got muscles and ligaments that are moving that hinge. If we don't address those muscles and ligaments, you're going to have other kinds of pains, right? So we want to make sure we're treating the joint as a whole. So again... Our motion is a combination of stopping the pain, breaking the inflammation cycle, promoting healing, and strengthening and reconditioning the joint. This all together leads to a very, very nice success rate because we screen patients, people that are candidates. If you're not a candidate, we will tell you we don't like to treat people that are not candidates because you don't get better, and then that doesn't go very well. So we'll take care of you. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Robert Dean.